April 2025. The world's media descends on a biotech lab outside Dallas where Colossal Biosciences unveils what they call the first true resurrection, three living dire wolf pups. For the press, it's a spectacle. Flashing cameras, scientists in white coats, and three squirming balls of fur with names straight out of myth and fantasy, Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi. The two brothers were born in October 2024, the little sister in January, each delivered by a gray wolf surrogate after a complicated, high-stakes pregnancy. If you're wondering how you get DNA from an animal that's been extinct for 13,000 years, the answer is buried in tar and ice. The team drilled into a fossil tooth from the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles and a 72,000-year-old skull recovered from the Canadian permafrost. Think of it as the world's coldest, longest-running freezer. The project's price tag? $15 million. That's about $5 million per puppy. Or, as one reporter joked, the most expensive game of fetch in history. But for Colossal, the cost is an investment in something bigger than puppies. This is the company that's already promised to bring back the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger, and even the dodo. Their announcement claims, without a hint of modesty, that these are the world's first true de-extinction births. The press release is pure Hollywood. The dire wolf walks the earth again. But behind the scenes, the story is less about ancient predators and more about a modern biotech arms race. The pups were bottle-fed after only a few days with their surrogate mother, who was so obsessed with cleaning them that she kept waking them up every hour. For the scientists, sleep was a distant memory. For the world, it was a headline. But for the dire wolf, it was something else entirely. A return that would soon be questioned by skeptics and experts alike. Long before Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi became headline material, dire wolves ruled North America. Their scientific name, Anosion Dirus, translates to something like terrible, fearsome, dog, um, and for good reason. These animals weren't just oversized wolves, they were the heavyweight champions of the Ice Age. A fully grown dire wolf tipped the scales at 150 to 200 pounds, towering over today's gray wolves, who usually max out around 120. If you think your neighbor's husky is big, imagine something built like a linebacker with the appetite to match. Dire wolves hunted in packs, sometimes up to 20 strong. Picture 20 sets of jaws, each with a bite force 30% stronger than any modern wolf. Fossil evidence shows they could crush bones with ease, feasting on the giant bison, horses, and camels that once roamed the continent. Their range stretched from Canada to southern Mexico, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. If you lived in North America between 250,000 and 13,000 years ago, you didn't want to hear a dire wolf howl at night, but even apex predators can't outrun extinction. As the last ice age ended, the climate warmed and the megafauna, the dire wolf's favorite prey, started vanishing. Human hunters arrived with new weapons and new competition. Dire wolves faced a triple threat, shrinking food supply, rising temperatures, and a two-legged rival who didn't play fair. They tried to adapt, but time ran out. By 13,000 years ago, the last dire wolf was gone, leaving behind only bones, teeth, and the occasional fossilized paw print. What's left is more than just a scientific curiosity. The dire wolf stands as a symbol of lost majesty, a reminder that even the mightiest can fall when the world changes faster than they do. Their story isn't just about extinction, it's about the scale of what once was, and the cost of what can never truly return. Colossal's press release promised the dire wolf was back, fur, fangs, and all. But when geneticists got a look under the hood, the story changed fast. Out of roughly 20,000 genes in a typical gray wolf, only 14 were edited for this project. That's not a typo, just 14. The team made 85 specific changes in total, out of about 2.5 billion base pairs. If you're keeping score, 
That's 0.0003% of the genome. For perspective, a real dire wolf and a gray wolf differ by about 6.7 million mutations. So if you were hoping for a prehistoric beast, what you've got is more like a gray wolf in a slightly bulkier Halloween costume. Scientists lined up to poke holes in the resurrection claim. Dr. Paul Knopfler from UC Davis summed it up best. This isn't de-extinction. This is a gray wolf with some dire wolf features, like putting a Mustang body on a Tesla and calling it a 1960s car. It may look the part, but under the surface, it's a whole different animal. The math doesn't lie, and neither does the DNA. For all the headlines, what's living in that enclosure is a genetically modified wolf. One with a little extra bite, but nowhere near a true return from the dead. Inside Colossal's lab, the process of resurrecting a dire wolf starts with a fossil and ends with a puppy, if you're lucky. Scientists in full personal protective equipment drill into ancient teeth and skulls, extracting DNA that's more dust than code. Computers line up what's salvageable against a modern gray wolf's genome, looking for the handful of differences that made a dire wolf a dire wolf. Then comes the scalpel work. C-R-I-S-P-R gene. Editors snip and swap out sections of gray wolf DNA, targeting 14 genes for size, skull shape, fur, jaws, and even coat color. It's less Jurassic Park and more extreme makeover, canine edition. The real magic, or madness, depending on your point of view, happens in the cloning suite. Scientists take a gray wolf egg, remove its nucleus, and replace it with the edited DNA. That egg is then implanted in a surrogate, usually a domestic dog for higher odds. Out of 47 attempts, only three pups made it to term. The rest? Failed pregnancies, developmental roadblocks, and a lot of late-night coffee for the team. Lab protocols read like a recipe for heartbreak monitor hormone cycles, track embryo development, prepare for emergency C-sections. Every successful birth is a minor miracle. Every failure is a reminder that nature doesn't hand out do-overs easily. Three live pups, 44 tries, and a process that's equal parts science, stubbornness, and a dash of wishful thinking. Money talks, and in the world of de-extinction, it practically shouts. Colossal's dire wolf project didn't just grab headlines. It pulled in a staggering $225 million in investment. The backers? A cast that reads like a fever dream. Paris Hilton, Tony Robbins, and for reasons best left to the imagination, the CIA's own venture capital fund, InQtel. Apparently nothing says national security like a genetically modified wolf puppy. The hype machine ran on overdrive. Naming a pup Khaleesi wasn't just a wink to Game of Thrones fans, it was a PR masterstroke. Social media exploded with photos of the pups, and suddenly, everyone from Silicon Valley to late night TV wanted a piece of the action. The dire wolf became a mascot for the next big thing in biotech, and Colossal milked every second of the spotlight. But all that buzz wasn't just about bringing back lost species. Investors saw something bigger, a proof of concept. If you can engineer a dire wolf, why not a mammoth or a dodo? The more spectacular the claim, the bigger the check. For Colossal, the real prize was never just puppies. It was the promise of a billion dollar biotech empire built on the back of a few photogenic canines and a mountain of viral headlines. Romulus limps across the enclosure, his back leg stiff despite weeks of gentle stretching. Every morning, the senior veterinarian logs his progress in a battered notebook, tracking the angles of his joints and the distance he manages before fatigue sets in. The physiotherapy routine is relentless. Heat packs, hydrotherapy, massage, all designed to coax a little more strength from a hip that never developed quite right. Remus, meanwhile, gets his own set of treatments, immune-boosting injections, careful monitoring for fevers, and a schedule of blood tests that would make a human patient complain. Khaleesi, the youngest, seems healthy for now, 
but her caretakers watch for any sign that the genetic edits might have missed something lurking beneath the surface. Life for these pups is a cycle of medical checks, enrichment activities, and supervised exercise. The facility is spotless, the staff attentive, but there's no wild to run in. Just a fenced preserve and a daily routine that never changes. The veterinary team debates each new protocol, balancing pain management with the risk of side effects. One vet, after a long shift, writes in her log, They're innocent. Whatever side you're on, they didn't ask for any of this. For all the talk of scientific triumph, the reality is quieter and more complicated. The pups' lives are measured in milligrams of medication, minutes on the treadmill, and the hope that tomorrow brings more comfort than today. Their struggles raise a question that science can't answer. How much suffering is acceptable for the sake of a breakthrough? The dire wolf pups aren't just a medical challenge, they're an ecological wild card. Out in the wild, there's no ice age prairie waiting for them, no herds of giant bison to chase. Instead, the modern landscape is a patchwork of cattle ranches, highways, and the last strongholds of endangered gray wolves. If these engineered canines ever left their fenced preserve, the consequences could ripple far beyond a single species. Conservationists have seen this movie before and it doesn't end well. Australia's cane toads were introduced in the 1930s to eat beetles. Instead, they ate everything but the beetles, poisoned native predators, and turned into a hopping disaster. Now, imagine a 180-pound predator with a bite force that could snap a femur, wandering into the ecosystem with no natural checks and a few genetic surprises. The real fear isn't just what these animals might hunt, but who they might date. Dire wolf genes, even in small doses, could flow into wild wolf populations creating hybrids that blur the line between engineered and natural. For the endangered gray wolf, already fighting for space and protection, this could mean genetic pollution, traits that don't belong, spreading through the population like an uninvited guest at a family reunion. Colossal claims it's ready for anything, reportedly securing up to $500 million in environmental liability insurance. Though, so far, nobody's seen the paperwork. Bioethicists warn that money can't fix a runaway gene. Once released, the effects can't be recalled, regulated, or refunded. As one put it, we're not just resurrecting a predator, we're rolling the dice with the entire ecosystem. Colossal doesn't just want to resurrect extinct animals, they want to patent the process. Behind every adorable dire wolf pup is a mountain of legal paperwork and a business plan that would make even Silicon Valley blush. In investor decks, Colossal claims a $10.2 billion valuation, though good luck finding a bank willing to back that number. The real currency here isn't wolf DNA, it's intellectual property. The company has filed more than 45 patent families covering everything from ancient DNA sequencing algorithms to the CRISPR-based gene editing platforms used to tweak those 14 genes. If you want to engineer your own prehistoric predator, you'll have to pay Colossal for the privilege. Licensing is where the real money is supposed to come in. The company's pitch, sell access to their patented genome editing toolkits to anyone who wants to save a species or maybe just build a cooler designer dog. As of late 2025, there's no audited record of licensing revenue, but the projections are ambitious, hundreds of millions by 2030 if you believe the slide deck. Ecotourism is also on the menu, with plans for a de-extinction zoo in Dallas and a genetic arc of endangered species DNA for future biotech deals. Ben Lamb, Colossal's CEO, is open about the strategy. In an interview, he called the dire wolf a stepping stone to bigger things, like the woolly mammoth. The goal isn't just to bring back lost species, it's to build the world's most valuable genetic toolbox. For Colossal, the pups are proof that the tech works, and a living, howling advertisement for a future where extinction is just another business opportunity. Colossal's ambitions don't end with three designer canines pacing a Texas enclosure. 
Their roadmap reads like a greatest hits list for the Ice Age Revival Tour. The first stop, a 2,000 acre controlled reserve in Texas, ringed with 10 foot fences and enough security to make Jurassic Park seem like a petting zoo. By 2026, they plan to release the engineered dire wolves into this private ranch, a test run for what they call rewilding. If all goes according to script, the next act is even bigger, literally. The company has circled 2027 for the arrival of a woolly mammoth calf, grown from gene-edited Asian elephant cells and destined for the frozen grasslands of Siberia's Pleistocene Park. By 2028, the Tasmanian tiger, extinct since the 1930s, is set to make a comeback. Two years later, the dodo bird, last seen waddling around Mauritius in the 17th century, is penciled in for a return. And if the investors keep signing checks, Colossal is eyeing saber-toothed cats by 2035. This isn't just a to-do list, it's a vision for a world where extinction is reversible and the past is something you can schedule. But not everyone is cheering. Dr. Beth Shapiro, Colossal's own chief scientist, offers a warning. We've opened Pandora's box, and we can't close it. With every milestone, the line between restoration and reinvention gets blurrier. The question isn't just which species can come back, it's what kind of world they'll be coming back to. In April 2025, Colossal Biosciences announced the birth of three pups, created with just 85 gene edits out of nearly 7 million differences between dire wolves and modern gray wolves. The project cost $15 million and relied on DNA from a 13,000-year-old tooth and a 72,000-year-old skull. Experts like Dr. Paul Knopfler have confirmed these animals are not true dire wolves, but hybrids with limited genetic changes. Veterinary records document health issues in the pups, and their lives are confined to a private facility, not the wild their ancestors once ruled. It remains unknown if these engineered animals could ever thrive outside captivity, or what impact future releases might have on ecosystems or endangered species. What is clear? The technology now exists to attempt resurrection, and the drive behind it is as much about patents and profit as conservation. The story of Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi marks a turning point. The question is no longer if we can undo extinction, but whether we should, and who gets to decide.